You know, it's no secret that the DIY PC building community has been thrown for a loop with the unavailability and inflation of certain components over the past few months. So today, I'm going to show you how to build a powerful gaming PC with parts that are readily available for under $1,000. If you haven't seen yet, I recently started a new Discord server for this channel. Join for free to have a more direct contact with myself and others in the PC building universe. Link will be in the description. So let's jump right into the details of what I had in mind when I decided to do this build. I made a checklist of features that I wanted this computer to have. First off, the budget. Our goal was to spend $1,000 or less on all components, including taxes. You know, I see a lot of budgeted PC build videos and they never include taxes in the cost. I know tax is different depending on where you live, but I'm including taxes in our budget. It's still money. Secondly, I wanted to choose a platform that could easily be upgraded in the future if so desired. This means being able to upgrade to the latest and greatest CPUs without having to swap out the motherboard and also being able to utilize PCIe Gen 4 if we got, say, a Gen 4 SSD or graphics card in the future. Thirdly, I want this computer to perform very well in the majority of games at 1080p. We won't be maxing out the settings on Cyberpunk, but I want this PC to be able to run popular titles with high frame rates at medium to high graphic settings. And lastly, I want this build to look nice. In the world of PC building, there's virtually no limit to the amount of money you can spend on the components, and appearance does play a big role in value. With our budget, we won't be building the most bougie looking rig out there, but $1,000 is still a lot of money, and while we are prioritizing performance over aesthetics, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to make this build easy on the eyes. PCs are like furniture, and you want your furniture to look nice, don't you? Just a quick disclaimer for anybody wanting to replicate this exact build, there is a good chance that the prices of these components have changed by the time you're watching this. If by chance you aren't able to get these exact same parts, don't worry. Choosing similar parts around the same price point is perfectly fine so long as they're from reputable manufacturers and so long as they're all compatible. Also, buying from the used market is also fine most of the time and can often save you a few bucks. So with our standard set, I went out part shopping, using PC Part Picker as a helpful tool. Let's pull up our checklist and price calculator as we look at the parts I've chosen to make sure we hit our mark. The one part I usually start with when building a PC is the CPU. By choosing a CPU first, we can build out the computer from there. For this build, we're going with Team Red. We've chosen the Ryzen 5 3600, a sweet spot processor utilizing AMD's Zen 2 architecture with 6 cores, 12 threads, PCIe Gen 4 compatibility, and a boost clock of 4.2 GHz. It'll be able to take on about any game thrown at it and can also handle a decent bit of streaming and video editing. We were able to bag this processor for $200 on Amazon. Since we have our CPU picked out, we need to choose a motherboard. Since we want to build the absolute best path for potential upgrades in the future, we're going with the B550 chipset. Now, if you want to save a few bucks, you can opt for the B450 chipset, as they also have a good path for upgrades, being compatible with the latest Ryzen 5000 series. But, B450 won't have PCIe 4.0 compatibilities, and we do want that in our build, even though for now, we won't be using a Gen 4 SSD. So we decided to go with the B550M Phantom Gaming 4 Micro ATX motherboard from ASRock for $90. It has 4 USB 3.2 ports, 2 USB 2.0 ports, 2 16 lane PCIe slots, one of which is Gen 4 compatible, as well as 2 M.2 SSD slots, one of which is also Gen 4 compatible. With this board and CPU, let's say you wanted to upgrade later to a newer RTX 30 series graphics card and a PCIe Gen 4 SSD. You could do that without missing out on the faster interface that PCIe Gen 4 has to offer. I think we can tick off our box for an easy path to upgrades. For our RAM, we went with a 16GB kit of Crucial Ballistics at 3000MHz. This kit is super popular and at $80 from Newegg, it'll fit in our budget. 16GB is the all around sweet spot for most gaming PCs and 3000MHz will be plenty fast for our needs. If you wanted to save some more money on the RAM, you could even opt for just one 8GB stick and you'd be a-okay. Just don't keep too many Chrome tabs open. Now looking at our storage options, which have significantly come down in price in recent months, we decided to go with an NVMe M.2 SSD. 
This is the XPG Gamix S7 512GB SSD by ADATA. It's a PCIe Gen 3 SSD with lightning fast sequential read and write speeds of up to 3500 and 3000 megabytes per second respectively. We were able to scoop this one up on Amazon for $60. Mini game file sizes are growing larger over time, but 512GB is enough to get you started with multiple games. Not to mention our motherboard has another M.2 SSD slot, so adding fast NVMe storage is no problem. Of course you could always add a SATA SSD or hard drive too, and if you wanted to shave down a little more on spending, you could just go with a single 2.5 inch SATA SSD instead of this one. For our purposes today and trying to squeeze as much performance out of a $1,000 budget, this SSD will do a fantastic job. Moving on to our power supply, there really isn't much to say other than A, we want at least an 80 plus bronze rating and B, no ketchup and mustard cables. With those two expectations in mind, we also want to have enough wattage to power our system. This 600 watt bronze rated PSU from EVGA is another popular buy and I totally understand why. It has all black cables and is relatively cheap at $64. 600 watts will leave plenty of headroom for what we're using today in our $1,000 build. And of course we have our chassis. This is another area where you could save money because there are lots of cases available online for $50 or less. The one we chose today is the Landcool 205M from Lian Li. It's a simple but clean looking micro ATX mid tower that sports a glass side panel, a full PSU shroud, and includes two black 120mm fans. It even comes in white if you wanted that. With two USB 3 ports, a headphone and microphone jack on the I.O., this case should have everything we need to get gaming. As I mentioned, you could save more money on your case if you needed to. I just chose this case because it was inexpensive at $60. It includes a PSU shroud, and because Lian Li has a reputation for outstanding quality and style. Now, finally, it's time to talk about the graphics card. This sole component is what has the entire PC building and gaming community butthurt at the moment. Personally, I don't want to talk about why or how the GP market is so jacked up right now, and I doubt you want to hear it. So all I'll say is this. First, if prices were the same now as they were a few months ago, this card would have been a 2060 or something similar. Spoiler, it's not a 2060. And second, everybody is paying more for GPUs than what they're worth right now since they're pretty much out of stock in all major retailers. With that in mind, we went with a GTX 1650, specifically the Dual Mini OC from Asus. This card is currently selling for about $400 on the open market, but we were able to get this one from a third party seller on Amazon for $350 brand new. Now, I want it to be known that when the 1650 launched in, in early 2019, its MSRP was around $180. So did we overpay for this card? Absolutely. But that's just how things are right now and no one can say when prices will come back down or, you know, for old or new hardware. Anyway, on to more about this card. It's Asus's Mini 1650, so it's of course a smaller form factor card intended for smaller cases. It has 4GB of GDDR6 VRAM, a max GPU core clock of 1650MHz, and being a 16 series card, utilizes Nvidia's Turing architecture just like the 20 series but without the RT cores. So ray tracing can be done, but not if you want those sweet, sweet frames. At 1080p, it'll be able to push plenty of frames and crush modern games at mid-high settings. Aesthetically, it looks alright. No backplate included, so that's kind of a downer, but it has tiny hint of RGB on the side, so that's nice. It really is a good card for, you know, like 200 bucks. But seriously, without me complaining, this is a great card, and even in the inflated market, a price of $350, it fits in our budget. Speaking of our budget, our price total comes out to $904 before taxes. After taxes for me here in Tennessee, USA, our total cost was $991.25. I'd say we just barely made our mark, so we can check that off our list as well. This is the last time I'll say it, but again, you can go cheaper than this by swapping out a few of the components. I simply just wanted to see how much performance I could get with a 1K budget in this absurd time that we live in. I'm not going to do a full build tutorial, but I'll quickly show a montage of the build process. If you do need a build guide, allow me to plug myself by referring you to my somewhat recent how to build a PC video. The steps are pretty much the exact same and if you ever have any questions feel free to ask me in the comments or you can join our channel's discord server for more direct contact with myself and other builders.
So that's about it. In my opinion, the build looks pretty clean. Opinionated, but I'm going to mark it off the list too. There's absolutely zero RGB except for that small little bit on the graphics card. Speaking of the graphics card, did you notice anything different about this card? Perhaps something that's missing? If you noticed already, props to you. There's no PCIe power cable running to our GPU. In fact, there's no PCIe power connector anywhere on the 1650. That's because it draws all of its power through the motherboard and doesn't require supplemental power from the power supply. Kind of weird, but nice to not see an extra cable on the build. If you need to know how to install Windows, I'm uploading a how-to video on that shortly after this video. Now that we know our PC works, we need to see how it games. We're going to test four games with this build, but before we do, we're going to see what kind of score this PC gets on Firestrike. Firestrike is 3 Mark's 1080p graphics test, and our score will tell us about where we stand in terms of what frame rate and graphics settings we can run in games. After a few runs of Firestrike, we were able to get a score of 9101, which is... okay. 3 Mark estimates that in games such as Fortnite or Apex Legends, we can get frame rates of over 60 FPS with ultra settings at 1080p. But let's be real, nobody plays competitive shooters on maximum settings, so we'll get well above that. But let's see for ourselves. Moving on to our actual gaming tests, first up we're going to try Rocket League. While it's not a graphically demanding game, Rocket League is among one of the top competitive esports titles, so we'll be able to see if our $1000 computer can push enough frames to be competitive. We're going to be using the performance preset for our graphics, but normally competitive players just use the lowest setting possible. After a few games recording our frame times, our average frame rate was 144 FPS. My frame rate setting was capped in game at 144 FPS because I'm playing on a 144Hz monitor, so we could get above 144 if we needed to. But it appears our PC can compete very well in competitive online titles. Next up we're going to be testing Horizon Zero Dawn, one of my favorite single player games to test. Even being a few years old at this point, Horizon is a matured and really beautiful game that can still be demanding for your graphics card depending on your settings. It really is a great game, if you haven't tried it, you know, you should, tr you should try it. Uh, playing for around 20 minutes on the original graphics preset, our average frame rate was 64 FPS, giving us ample performance for smooth play and stunning scenery. Now looking at F1 2020, which our 1650 handled very well at 1080p on the high graphics preset, we can see an average frame rate of 136 FPS. F1 plays just great, and it looks like we might just get a podium with our $1000 PC. And last up is Cyberpunk. This test is sort of on the side of, I probably need to upgrade the graphics card first. At least, if you want to enjoy everything the game has to offer, like real-time ray tracing or dense city crowds. Playing on the lowest graphic preset with low crowd density yielded the best results, with an average frame rate of 46 FPS. I wouldn't consider this smooth gameplay, but if you were desperate enough, you could technically play if, you know, if you wanted. Overall, this rig performed just fine in most of our AAA titles at 1080p, so I'm going to check our performance goal off the list as well. And just a side note on the acoustics, our noise levels were never very loud even when under load. The very last thing I wanted to talk about is where to go from here. If you built this same PC, what should you do in terms of upgrades? While no upgrades are necessarily needed immediately, I would highly recommend getting some of these upgrades as soon as you're able to. Here is my priority upgrade list for this PC. First off is getting more storage. 512GB is plenty for getting started but most likely will fill up quickly. In any form that you see fit, whether it be a hard drive, SATA SSD, or NVMe SSD, get yourself some more storage when you can. If you do decide to get another NVMe M.2 SSD, I would highly suggest getting a PCIe Gen 4 in at least 1TB and using it as your Windows boot drive. Just make sure you install it in the right slot on the motherboard since only one of the two M.2 slots is Gen 4 compatible. The next upgrade, of course, would be the graphics card. Our 1650 is just fine for getting us gaming with the boys, but long term, you're gonna want something with a little more... a little more oomph. And more VRAM. As soon as GPU prices come back to normal and as soon as you can manage it, I would suggest a card such as Nvidia's 3060 or 3070, as they would offer enough performance to play you know, pretty much any game at max settings and would also provide enough horsepower to game at a higher resolution like 1440 or 4K. And finally, any other upgrade that you feel necessary should come after storage and the GPU. 
Every PC user is different and uses their PC for different tasks. Perhaps you want to edit 4K video and need quicker rendering times than what this Ryzen 5 3600 offers. Upgrade to a newer Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 9 with more cores. Perhaps you need better cooling for your nicer CPU. Get an AIO liquid cooler or a beefy aftermarket air cooler. Or maybe you need more RAM to handle all of your multitasking more efficiently. Buy more sticks of RAM. It's your computer to take on any upgrade path that you see fit. And thanks to our planning, you won't need to start from the ground up to make these changes. Also, never forget that you can always add more performance by overclocking your CPU if it's unlocked, as well as your GPU. Everything you've seen here has been stock speeds and not overclocked. Well, that's going to wrap up my $1,000 budget PC build video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you gained some knowledge on the right path to take with your build. It's rough times out here for builders who want max performance without breaking the bank, but there are always some serious benefits to building a PC over buying one. I'll do my very best to get to every question posted in the comments. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.